Well, Rod is a pretty act to follow, pretty hard act to follow. Dagnia's introduction even more so. But to those watching in the live stream audience, this is a very daunting audience before me. Uh, we have very many leaders that I think could even be seen as better than myself. Of course, many of them women, if not most of them. Uh, and quite a lot of people that clearly have high expectations to my small contribution to this marvelous event. You know, I grew up in Canada and West Germany in the past century uh, at a time when one believed that it was the dawn of the age of Aquarius. It was a time when there were real borders between countries. The Cold War was really cold. Hair was long, fashion floral, and those that are today becoming legitimate marijuana mil millionaires probably took their first toques. And the spirit and ambitions of the time are encapsulated by a song from Fifth Dimension. When the moon is in the seventh house and Jupiter aligns with Mars, then peace will guide the planets and love will steer the stars. This is the dawning of the age of Aquarius, the age of Aquarius, Aquarius. Harmony and understanding, sympathy and trust abounding. No more falsehoods or derisions, golden living dreams of visions, mystic crystal revelation, and the mind's true liberation, Aquarius. Peace, harmony, understanding, sympathy, and trust. But if we look around ourselves today, I fear my generation has failed the promise of the age of Aquarius. We see countries, nations, companies, even NGO activities beset by an air of distrust, dishonesty, dissatisfaction, and communities far from harmony, almost anywhere in the world. We live in an era of disappointment and lack of trust with our institutions, which to a large extent is exactly what the previous presentation said. Trust, you know, is the foundation for any reputation, and you cannot be a leader without trust. Not too long ago, companies in doing business were expected to deliver profits and growth. In countries with a more social democratic leaning, such as Germany, France, or Sweden, a responsibility for job creation or job security may be added to the required remit. But I believe that today, with global connectivity being what it is, with an immense movement of people, religions, and expectations around the globe, I'm convinced that we need to revisit what counts to be able to return to healthier and better functioning societies. Today, companies must perform beyond profits. So my assumptions from so many years ago at the American Chamber haven't changed one iota. I like the double entendre of the words, what counts. On one hand, it means counting something. On the other, being accountable for something. But we want it to mean what is important. In business or government, it should mean that if we pay attention to what counts in our business, it can have a tangible value. Now, Dagnia proposed a different title for this intervention, namely reinventing, the leadership, reinventing Leadership in the Boardroom, What Counts Beyond Spreadsheets. I actually think that what counts needs leadership anywhere, as the boardroom or a spreadsheet is quite a limiting space. So what counts? I believe still that it is a focus on transparency sustainability, and people. If you are able to address three, these three areas in detail, quantify them, give them content, measure them, you will see that your business will gain benefit, or for that matter, any other institution. What may this entail? 
the World Economic Forum has this exemplary chart on what it takes to have good governance in companies. Studies have long proven that well-governed companies or institutions prove by their actions that they are responsible businesses, and with that, gain the trust of investors, customers, and suppliers. They are able to continuously strengthen their reputation, which in turn tends to strengthen the balance sheet in good times and in bad. But for me, what counts most is a commitment to sustainability in the broader definition of that word. Every little bit counts when contributing to a more sustainable world. Addressing any single area in these circles in a concrete manner tends to ultimately reduce costs, increase efficiency and effectivity in businesses, work towards attaining the world's climate goals, and increases trust in institutions and individuals. And I see several people not being able to see what's on the chart, so let me give you a wee tiny insight. Here at the top, let's see, does this work? No, it doesn't work. At the top, the green circle addresses the environmental, which is natural resource use, environmental management, or pollution prevention, for example. The red circle addresses social issues, which deal with people. That's education, community, standards of living, equal opportunity, all of that stuff. And there's economic, there's the orange economic component of profit, cost savings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because without economy, without social, without the environmental, you don't get the thing in the middle, which is very good sustainability. Now, before I give you two concrete examples of this, let me hone in on a little known but high impact aspect of sustainability, namely the role of human rights. Who will tell me how many there are human? How many human rights are there? Anybody know? Take a guess. Oh. I've talked to human rights people who usually don't know. There are 30. The thir look, up, look up the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We have 30 different human rights. Usually we talk about free speech, those kinds of things, but it all, all goes down even to the right to water, for example. Now, I said earlier, people count. I hope you remember that. Now, while there has been a universal declaration on human rights since 1948, just over five years ago, the Human Rights Council, the United Nations Human Rights Council, ratified the guiding principles on human rights and business. And I had the privilege of party, partly working with this document. The framework for the principle states that governments have the obligation to protect but business to respect human rights, while all individuals have the right to remedy when there are human rights violations. That's where protect, respect, remedy comes from. You may think that this is too lofty a notion for business. And Bolts usually state, we're not ready for any of this yet. We still have some growth to do and different things to do. But have a look at them when you have the time. Each of the 23 principles have clear and field-tested cases that deal, for example, with labor rights, remuneration, safety and security for people, even access to water, for example. And when you don't have access to water, when water is not in a community, you do not have the opportunity to grow food, people go hungry, and they start moving around the globe one of the biggest challenges that this era is facing. I believe that the guiding principles on human rights and business is one of the best hands-on guidance books for business in particular to work with. It counts and it can pay off. So how does that happen? Yesterday, well, there we are. Last night, I wasn't going to talk about Rail Baltica because on most people's minds in the audience is the fact that I have the privilege of leading an organization that is going to build a European gauge railway from Tallinn to Berlin at high speeds. It is really the project of the century for our era. And it's unbelievably challenging stakeholder management 
I, maybe we'll be able to talk about it in a reputation time conference about two to three years from now, if I survive it. Last night, actually, Christoph, when we were talking about these different values, he said, so how are you going to deal with this in Real Baltica? And uh, it was a very good question because I'm still in the, in the process of setting up an organization and figuring out what we're really going to do, you know, with the five billion euro that we have. But in essence, my task is not about, or my challenge is not about building a railway. It is dealing with procurement of the five billion euro. Who is going to get it? How it's going to be used? And what will the effect of those investments ultimately be? And when you look at it from a transparency, sustainability, and people prism, and I can tell you my stakeholders are far from looking at these issues at this point in time. It is really a question, it is really a question of finding hands-on tools to address this, to make sure that everybody is well treated. It can be done in contractual environments. It needs to be actually done in contractual environments. It needs to be accounted for publicly. You're very right, transparency is sort of a thing that everybody talks about, but let's understand what it is in terms of transparency and having transparency in good ways of having people actually get the contracts right down to the sub, 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 sub contractor level where you need safety and security. And when you do all of that properly, I know that we will have A, a brilliant and exemplary uh, railway taking us quickly from Tallinn to Berlin. Uh, but more importantly, we will have invested in the individuals around us, in our societies, and in the region at large, creating a good economic strategy. Now in business, when I leave Real Baltica behind me, there's a very famous global case of understanding what counts by deciding to put sustainability at the core of its business, and that's the case of Unilever. In 2009, Paul Pullman became Unilever's CEO, and he's quite a celebrated guy for what he has done uh, uh, over the years. At that time, he set a target for the company to double its size while reducing its overall environmental footprint and improve its social impact through a so-called Unilever sustainability living plan. And now I wonder if the hyperlink will st start. Let's see. No, it doesn't do that, does it? Have a look at it. Take a look at Unilever's uh, uh, homepage, and you will see they have a plan that they've shared with everybody called the sustainable living plan. Pullman argued that in a volatile world of finite resources, running a business sustainably is vital for long-term growth, in emerging markets in particular, because that's really their marketplace, and it also mitigates risk and reduces cost. I can tell you that from the oil and gas industry that I've served with for many years, this is certainly the case when you not only look at the numbers and look at the reserves, but you put sustainability in the core of your, at the core of your business. Pullman's been very successful. In five years' time, Unilever has outperformed its key competitor, Procter & Gamble, by far, on the stock market, in profits, in market share, and in reputation. Now, remarkably, behaving responsibly and focusing on what counts, transparency, sustainability, and people, also make countries better. To wit, this chart compares different top 10 lists from 2013. I don't, didn't have all the data for 2014 yet. But it demonstrates that being rich, which is on the right-hand side, you see all of the rich top 10 nations, don't make you happy, necessarily, or provide for a good quality of life in your country. In fact, if you take a look at all the countries, there are several that are on all of the lists, I think three or four countries, and they are on the right-hand list, only Qatar, Luxembourg, Brunei, United States, and San Marino, what a collection, are only in the richest list. They're not even close to quality of life or happiest nations. So what do we look like? We don't have the quality of life, same quality of life uh, 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 no, measurements. But we see where, who are happiest. Happiest in the region, Poland, 
least happy Russia. Same thing around the corruption perception index. You see Estonia and Poland more to the top, Lithuania, Latvia somewhere in the middle. To, in the middle. Uh, and richest, you know, is also relative in the middle. What does this mean to me? The Baltic countries have great potential for climbing up the charts to strive for, say, ranking between 15 and 25. I would challenge any of the Baltic governments to find a plan how to do that. If they were to focus on better management of transparency, focus on sustainability within any of the programs that the governments are responsible for, and focus on serving the people that they're supposed to serve, I have no doubt we will go up to 15 or so. Because what counts is understanding what to commit to and how to do it. <laughs> so what do I think success would look like if you were actually going to do it? I believe that in the realm of transparency, sustainability, and people focus, if you can demonstrate that you, what you are doing well, you'll build loyalty and trust. And this creates a sound basis for commitment by your customers or citizens to your company or cause, which can measurably be translated into profits for a company or more taxes, better managed for a government. And the key result is a trustworthy reputation. Now, Three years ago, I had the privilege of speaking at TEDx Riga about what it takes to build better societies. In summary, what I pointed out then still counts. Number one, understand the community or stakeholders you want to impact and be ready to manage its expectations. Rod kind of said the same thing. And maybe your next conference should be about expectation management, the toughest thing any leader has to do. Secondly, Realize that the role and common understanding of transparency and openness of anything is increasingly misunderstood and underestimated. And that thirdly, trust, mutual trust, is quintessential if change of any kind is to happen. Peace, harmony, understanding, sympathy, and trust. I still believe that that's what really counts. Whoops. Thank you for your patience with my meanderings. <laughs> <laughs>